an eighth special presentation. This time on Artbeat Nation. A guitar maker who carves the past into every new instrument. I'm trying to make a new guitar, but there's a whole prehistory that I build into the guitar. Weaving history and tradition into home decor. It had its practical uses, but it also had its very uh, emotional use of their heritage. How one art contest has doubled as a wildlife protection program. It's run like um, the Miss America pageant or American Idol. And an immigrant who found her voice through poetry. For me, writing is not about the subject, the verb, and the noun. It is a sequencing of meaning, a chase after inspiration. It's all ahead on this edition of Artbeat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you. First, we meet Joel Danzig, a musician and accomplished guitar maker. One of Danzig's most famous creations was the five-neck guitar he built for the lead guitarist in the band Cheap Trick. Ed Weir's Vicky takes us inside Danzig's shop to find out how he adds his special touch to every instrument he makes. Long before his hands begin their labor of love, Joel Danzig dreams up guitars with some definite DNA. It's totally about surrounding myself with inspiration and almost in a subconscious way building an instrument to a theme. One of the world's finest guitar makers, this thoroughly modern luthier has given birth to some of the most iconic electrics ever, including custom designs for hundreds of artists like the Beatles, Pearl Jam, the Police, and this five-neck monster for Cheap Tricks, Rick Nielsen. He's not like a standard luthier where he's just a craftsman. And there are those guys that build beautiful instruments and, and know how to play him a little bit, but Joel really knows the music because he started out as a musician. A hopeful musician in hometown Chicago in the early 70s, it was his day job fixing and reselling instruments that pushed his talents and technical skills one big step further. Once you've repaired and restored old guitars, it's just really a hop, skip, and a jump to building one from scratch. So in 1973, with Fix-It partner Paul Hamer, their new line of guitars was launched. And as sales for electrics boomed in a pop culture crazed by the British invasion, so did Hamer Guitars and Danzig's career. He took the quality of Gibson and because it was a smaller shop, was able to detail it and make everything perfect. They took Gibson and put it on steroids. In 2010, after a three-decade career, creating his own vintage guitar label became the logical destination. I was fascinated with these older guitars, the ones from the 30s through the 50s, before vintage guitars were really called vintage guitars. They have a soul. They have a story. By the time you get it, that instrument has, has witnessed all kinds of things toggle switches, dials, and electrical wiring. It's stuff like this you find tucked away at the local hardware. But to Joel Danzig, it's a little bit like buried treasure, especially if they've been used before. These are old switches that were in operator switchboards in Chicago. I can use it to control the electronics on the instrument, and it has the old cloth-covered wire, so I'll refurbish this. Imagine if you could hear all the conversations that went through this switch <laughs> and all these wires. I'm trying to make a new guitar, but there's a whole prehistory that I build into the guitar. Well, this is inspired by a place in Fort Worth in the 1800s where all the cowboys would go for their, their pleasure. 
This is uh, maple and ebony checks. And to me, it kind of looks like a lariat. So I want to put this around the entire guitar. Today, in the woods that surround his Connecticut studio, Danzig lets his ideas unfold. With each handmade guitar, he's rekindled that creative idealism once inspired by a single childhood memory. I must have been like 10 years old or something. One of the camp counselors brought an electric guitar and an amplifier to camp. I'd never seen anything like this. It was, it was a guitar, somehow electrical, so it like pushed all the right buttons for me. It was music that was as loud as a race car. Everything about it just captured my imagination, and that's when I knew I, I had to be part of that. To see some of Danzig's recent work, visit his website at danzig.com. Ukrainian kilims are woven tapestries used for dowries, and even funerals, and each one has its own story. We visit the Ukrainian Museum in New York City to hear about the kilims. Today I would like to introduce you to an exhibit of Ukrainian kilims, which date from the late 18th century until the 1930s. The Ukrainian kilims are flat tapestry woven textiles. Traditionally, they were used as hangings on the wall, covering tables, benches, and in the ritual traditions, they were used as dowry and also in funeral rituals. The kilims in Ukraine were woven on two types of looms, horizontal and vertical. Horizontal looms were used more for geometric designs, whereas vertical looms were used more for floral designs. We have an example here of a horizontal loom with the kilim right on it in the process of being woven. All of these kilims were donated to the museum by the owners who brought them over um, in the late 40s and early 50s. In their exodus from Ukraine, escaping Soviet occupation, many of them took a kilim. During their long trek, it had its practical uses, but it also had its very uh, emotional use of their heritage. This kilim was woven in 1890, probably by descendants of Kazakh weavers in Eastern Podilia region. That region for a while was under the Ottoman Empire. And so if you look closely at the kilim, you can see a traditional stylized floral motif, and yet it's encircled in a branch or a vine that is very, very much reminiscent of Turkish and Persian calligraphy. This kilim has quite a fascinating story. The kilim was woven by a father in a small Ukrainian village for his daughter's dowry in 1912. And as if intuitively sensing the turmoil that they will have to face, he used the representation of the tree of life, which is symbol of continuity. Then came the revolution, World War I, they were persecuted, and during Stalin's purge, they were exiled to the coal mines in the Donetsk region. When the Germans occupied Ukraine, they were sent to forced labor uh, camps in Germany, and then eventually emigrated to the United States. Throughout all of this time, the Kilim was always with them, as if protecting their existence uh, and also giving them their identity. Mm -hmm. 
This was made in the 1930s. The artist's name is Svetoslav Hordinsky. He, throughout his whole life, was fascinated by Ukrainian folk art. He studied in France for a while and then returned to Ukraine and brought with him all of the avant-garde motifs. But he felt that folk artists were the basis from which modern artists start. And so he uh, tried to incorporate into this design of the kilim, a stylized floral motif traditional to the Ukrainian folk art and an avant-garde motif. What could draw hundreds of artists and be the inspiration of a decades-long national art contest? Believe it or not, ducks. Next, Maria Hall Brown talks to an author who wrote the book about the contest that also has become the most successful wildlife protection program in America's history. All of these fine feathered fowl owe their government a big thank you. It seems for decades an art competition paints a pretty picture for their preservation. Of course, you can't expect the ducks to take notice, but Martin Smith did. The Duck Stamp Program is this obscure, archaic little government program that's existed since 1934, so far off the cultural radar that pretty much nobody outside this very insular world knows it exists. And for me, it was, it was this amazing discovery. Amazing indeed, and fascinating. Every year between about 200 and 250 wildlife artists, the best wildlife artists in the country, compete for the honor of having their painting on the federal duck stamp. Now the interesting thing about it to me is that there's no prize money with this. The winner gets a pane of their own stamp signed by the Secretary of the Interior. The winner also keeps the rights to the art, which could be somewhat profitable, but the duck stamp should not be confused with a postage stamp. It's what's called a revenue stamp, um, and it was uh, since 1934, hunters have essentially been taxing themselves to raise money to buy habitat to preserve the resource they use, which is waterfowl. This is the only federally sponsored art competition. Exactly. You'd think that would come out of the National Endowment for the Arts, but in fact it comes out of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and it's fascinating. It's run like um, the Miss America pageant or American Idol. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's done by the book by a, a very small group of people at the Duck Stamp Office in Washington um, who, um, you know, who, who you know, take, take the, the, um, the protocols very seriously. It's like watching Kabuki theater. It's staged so carefully. They are so careful about fairness and integrity, um, right down to keeping the names of the judges absolutely private until they come out and take the stage for the judging. Given the current population of ducks frolicking in this small suburban haven, the forward thinking of our forefathers should be commended. When you're surrounded by a resource that seems endless and limitless, like air, or at that time, back in the 17th and 18th century, waterfowl, um, why conserve? It makes no sense, because there's always more. Well, we got to a point in the early part of the, the 20th century where there really weren't any more. We were very down, the populations were very, very low. Um, and that's when it got so bad that suddenly government stepped in. Uh, and that was at a time when government was pretty effective. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided, we're going to solve this problem. He hired a guy named Ding Darling to be what is essentially the Secretary of the Interior, or, or Secretary of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and he had the idea to create this program that would not only um, raise revenue, but it would identify habitat, critical habitat, and use that revenue to preserve that habitat. That started, you know, more than 75 years ago. In the last 75 years, the program has conserved an area approximately the size of Massachusetts. An artistic, novel, and successful approach to conservation that works, even if it appears to work at cross-purposes to some. Birders who don't hunt, they are the opposite of hunters. They just like to look at birds. They benefit by duck stamp money because the National Wildlife Refuge System was in part built with duck stamp money. Each year only certain species selected can be lovingly portrayed, and the reasons a painting will or will not be selected outnumber the feathers on a duck. But one family seems to have the golden artistic touch. The Hoffman brothers, there are three brothers in Minnesota who um, 
are known as the New York Yankees at the duck stamp contest. They are the most dominant force in duck stamp painting for the last 25 years. And um, there are three brothers who have be between them won it 10 times in the last 23 years, which is almost a mathematical impossibility because when you win it, you have to sit out for three years. Um, their record is extraordinary. And it turns out that the Hopman brothers and the Cohen brothers were childhood friends growing up in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. You betcha. For more information on the contest and Martin Smith's book, visit wildduckchase.com. Art has the ability to give a voice to people and communities. After the hardship of emigrating from a Thai refugee camp as a child, writer Kao Kalia Yang did not speak for years, but now she's found her voice. Here she shares some of her experiences from her memoir. My name is Ngo Kalia Ya, and I'm a writer from the Hmong community. But I'm also discovering that I'm very much a Minnesotan author, and perhaps I'm even, I know I am, an American writer, and I'm contributing to world literature. From the sky, babies can see the course of human lives. This is what the Hmong children of my generation are told by our mothers and fathers. They teach us that we have chosen our lives, that the people who will become, we had inside of us from the beginning. The book begins in 1975, um, when, the, when the last Air America planes leave the country with the declaration of genocide against the Hmong. Only they, the Hmong didn't know it. And I wasn't born yet, but it is a memoir. And memoirs are not only the memories we hold, but they are the memories passed on to us. And they exist within the frameworks of a bigger world memory. So that's when it begins. Lots of research, lots of going back to the stories that were told to me, not because I was writing a book, but because everybody wanted to explain why my life was the way it was, why Thanksgiving was meals on wheels, and why Christmas destroys her tops. My grandma um, promised me she never die because I was born in a refugee camp, 400 acres, less than a square mile in, in radius with 40 to 50,000 people. By the time I came along, grandma was already an old woman with just a single tooth. And she had seen so many grow up and so many change and so many fall down again that she was just happy for this young life to love because the Mara knew to what is written. It was with our words that we sought to write and to each other. So I heard so much, so much beautiful language, so many stories. Walking beneath the trees in the compound, my father would say, like the sun is dancing in your skin because it loves you. When the puppies can't open their eyes, he said, it is because your world is so bright. My father used to carry me to the tops of the trees, and he'd hold my hand, and he'd say, he'd say the size of your hand and your feet will not dictate your life journey. One day your feet will walk on the horizons your father has never seen. And he never lied to me, so I believed him. But we came to America. I was six years old, July 27, 1987. We landed at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, and we drove to the McDonough Housing Project, but we drove through downtown St. Paul. And it was a, a highway of dancing lights to St. Paul, and then lights extending beyond. And I thought, in a world where you can, you, like this, you can follow the lights, and you'll never get lost. But I got lost in America. Because we lived in the in the east side of St. Paul in a 900 square feet home with rotting walls, growing walls with mold. Everybody was always sick. Taylor, my baby sister, had astronomical levels of blood. She couldn't tell the difference between a three and S or a five. And one day I came home and I'd never been to a movie theater. So I told my mom and my dad, I, I, I looked at my father in the eye and I told him I hadn't chosen this life that I didn't want it this way that I don't want to belong in a world where a kid has to imagine the insides of a movie theater to be normal. And my father said he would choose me all over again if he could. And that a long time ago, I saw him and my mother walking without shoes, and I chose to come down to them. My father said that life would teach me how strong the human heart is, not how weak or how fragile. So I tried again. I tried harder. And I became a, a, a senior at Carleton College, and my grandma said, that education was the garden that I cultivated in America and that one day we would reap the harvest together. But she falls down. My senior year, she falls down. And I go to her and I say, get up, Grandma, get up. And she goes, I can't get up. She says, there were people who loved me before you. Long before you, I had a mom and a dad and brothers and sisters. And somewhere in time, they're waiting for me. It would be selfish of you to hold me back. 
because when you look at the map, there is no long land. I'm going to climb the mountain of my heart to the house of my youth, and everybody will say, where have you been? We've been so worried. Why are you so late in coming home? I entered Uncle Ang's house and wiped my feet on the rug, looked up and saw my grandmother in a hospital bed beside their east wall. She looked like she was sleeping. I took off my shoes and I approached the bed slowly. Aunt Chu was sitting by the side of the bed on a chair. A few relatives were on the sofa by the window talking quietly. When I saw that Grandma was not sleeping but struggling for breath, her hair matted with sweat, her lips opening and closing in desperation, her one tooth showing, the image became blurry. I got as close as I could to her. I felt the bed rail against my thigh. I put my head on her chest. I said, Grandma, I am here. I said, Grandma, are you okay? I said, Grandma, I love you. I said, Grandma, don't leave me. I said, Grandma, Kalia is here. I said, Grandma, are you okay? I said, Grandma, I am here. I said the same things over and over, and my heart was heavy in my chest, and every breath became harder. I made a lot of noise. She raised a tire hand to my head, and she said, Grandma knows. I said, I love you, Grandma. And she said, don't cry, man. I, Grandma knows. She tried to say more things to me, and I tried not to cry, but neither of us could do what we wanted. In all the languages of the earth, in all the richness of words, there is no word, no comparison, no equivalent for my grandmother trying to be strong for me. In moments of danger, long people do one of two things. We flee or we fight. And I, and I, and I, and I, it occurred to me, no, there's a moment in between. And sometimes that moment stretches for years. And I understand that all of art speaks to each other. All of literature is in the conversation. And so I wanted to speak to that moment of fleeing and fighting, the moment in between, the moment that lives like mine come from. And, and so it becomes um, a story about a young writer in America trying to garner a voice in a world where she had gone silent. Because when I was seven, we went to Kmart, and my mom was looking for light bulbs, and she pointed to the ceiling. She says, I'm looking for the thing that makes the world shiny. But she has an accent. So the clerk doesn't really understand. And the clerk walks away. And because Laos is the most heavily bombed nation in the world, and my mom and dad grew up in the most heavily bombed province of Laos, because my father said that when, grown man, when the bombs fell and grown man ran, my mother would walk. I'd always thought she was incredibly brave. But in that Kmart, she didn't know where to look. So she looked at her feet. She couldn't look at me. And I decided that if the world didn't need to hear my mother and my father, then surely it didn't need to hear me. So I stopped talking the next day. I've only been speaking for almost two years, the publication of the book, April of 2008. I was a selective mute for most of my life. I never thought that I would um, make my living because young writers are not paid to write, we're paid to speak. If we're, if we're any good, then I would make my life in words spoken. But I do it. I do it because I know so many people who cannot speak. Even when the words are there, like my father, who will not be listened to. So I feel I have a great deal of responsibility and a great deal of work to do. For me, writing is not about the subject, the verb, and the noun. It is a sequencing of meaning, a chase after inspiration, to see whether one word has the power to call in the next. Plus, the work that we do in the moment lives in the moment. No matter what happens tomorrow, the work I do today stands. Hal Kalia Yang's 2008 book, The Late Homecomer, won both a Minnesota Book Award and the Reader's Choice Award. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find featured videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.